Nintendo is a game company that's known for a lot of things. Iconic characters, incredibly successful franchises, unique console ideas and concepts. But one thing I feel like a lot of people don't think about are the individuals that make Nintendo what it's known for. And one of the most important people in that respect is a man named Gunpei Yokoi. Gunpei Yokoi was born on the 10th of September 1941 in Kyoto, Japan. He graduated from Doshisha University with a degree in electronics and was later hired by Nintendo in 1965. His first job at the company was to maintain the machines used to manufacture Hanafuda cards, which are basically a popular brand of Japanese playing card that have a surprisingly long history within the company that could honestly be its own video. But essentially, before Nintendo started working on games, they primarily focused on producing and selling handcrafted Hanafuda. And interestingly enough, the company was actually founded for this one purpose all the way back in 1889. In 1966, Hiroshi Yamauchi, the president of Nintendo at the time, came to a Hanafuda factory where Yokoi was working and took notice of a toy he had, which was an extending arm that Yokoi made in his spare time for his own amusement while doing maintenance. Yamauchi would then ask Yokoi to develop it as a proper product for the Christmas rush, and just like that, the Ultra Hand was born. As Yamauchi predicted, it turned out to be a massive success during the holidays, and Yokoi would later be asked to work on several other toys for the company, including the 10 billion barrel puzzle, a miniature remote controlled vacuum cleaner called the Chiratori, a baseball throwing machine called the Ultra Machine, and a love tester. Yokoi would keep working on toys for Nintendo until the company decided to shift its focus to making video games in 1974 and he quickly became one of the company's first game designers. In 1981, Yamauchi appointed Yokoi to supervise Donkey Kong, an arcade game originally created by Shigeru Miyamoto. Yokoi explained many of the intricacies of game design to Miyamoto at the beginning of his career, and the project only came to be approved after Yokoi brought Miyamoto's game ideas to Yamauchi's attention. So although Yokoi didn't create Donkey Kong, he did help Miyamoto refine it to being what is known as now, and essentially worked as an outlet for his ideas that may not have seen the light of day otherwise. Obviously the Donkey Kong arcade game went on to be a massive worldwide success and is easily one of the most well known arcade games ever made. After this major success, Yokoi would continue to work with Miyamoto on a spin-off title that would soon change everything for Nintendo, and that was Mario Bros. Like Donkey Kong, it was a fairly simple 2D side-scrolling arcade game that would later pave the way for the Super Mario Bros series that wouldn't just be important for Nintendo but for the entire gaming industry at one point. During development for Mario Bros, Yokoi proposed the multiplayer concept that helped make the game so popular, and he would also convince his co-worker to give Mario some superhuman abilities, such as being able to jump from any height, unlike how Mario worked in the Donkey Kong arcade game. After Mario Bros, Yokoi produced several other substantial games for the company, with the most notable ones being Kid Icarus, Metroid, Super Mario Land, and Duck Hunt. And he also designed Rob, which was basically used as an extremely smart marketing ploy to convince kids to buy an NES during the video game crash of 1983. Yokoi also created the Game & Watch handheld, which was the first handheld gaming console Nintendo ever made, and seemed way ahead of its time considering it was released in 1980 with the concept being substantially more impressive than its hardware, but it would also pave the way for his most popular creation yet. After the prominent success of the Nintendo Entertainment System, Yokoi held a meeting with Hiroshi Yamauchi, saying that he could do a handheld system with interchangeable games. This would of course birth the original Game Boy. The Game Boy was first released in Japan on April 21st, 1989, and later came to North America in August, and then Europe in early 1990. And it's not hard to see why it was such a worldwide success. In the early 90s, there simply wasn't anything like it. A handheld that could instantly load games, had a long battery life, an affordable price, and was simple to use, that's just a perfect concoction right there. And I haven't even mentioned the actual games made for it. There's a long list of titles, with some of the hard hitters being Super Mario Land, Tetris, Metroid, Final Fantasy, Kirby, and how can I forget the handheld gaming juggernaut that is Pokemon. The Game Boy would truly push portable gaming to the mass market, and without it, many important handhelds in Nintendo's history may never have been made. Even just the evolution of the Game Boy alone would create several successful handhelds for the company, like the Game Boy Color, the Game Boy Advanced, the Game Boy Micro, and the list goes on. 
on. Not to mention the attachments you'd get for them too. So clearly the Game Boy was Yokoi's most successful creation by far, with the handheld selling over 100 million units worldwide in its 14 year lifespan. But unfortunately what he'd create after it would also be his least successful. On July 21st 1995 the Virtual Boy would be released in Japan and would also be launched in North America a month later. At this point in Yokoi's career he had already planned on leaving Nintendo many times and apparently he was first meant to retire at age 50. But he chose to delay his retirement for a couple more years and got to work on the Virtual Boy as his last project for Nintendo before departing. To make the Virtual Boy Nintendo would acquire hardware from Reflection Technologies, an American based company experimenting with vibrating mirror technology. And the Virtual Boy would go through many forms in Nintendo's R&D department. Starting as a pair of goggles that proved to be too heavy and would suffer from visual distortion thanks to the processing chip which was located next to the wearer's head. Early designs like these were ultimately scrapped thanks to liability concerns and they would eventually go with the design we all know today. A rigid 32-bit tabletop system that was pretty vulgar to look at and didn't make much sense and one that Yokoi absolutely hated. To him in a similar vein to the Game Boy which I imagine is why he chose the name the portability of the Virtual Boy had always been its greatest asset. The entire unit had been designed to be a mobile 3D console. Because of this, to keep the battery from draining too quickly, Yokoi chose to use a less powerful processing chip. But now that the console was going to be a less mobile gaming device, Yokoi just didn't see the allure of the system. He suggested numerous times to the Nintendo executives to give him more time to develop the system properly and to allow him to create a more intuitive, alluring design. But the advice fell on deaf ears. Due to the impending release of the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation 1994, Yamauchi and the marketing team at Nintendo pressured Yokoi to finish the Virtual Boy and launch it as soon as possible. As Nintendo's next console and major competitor to other companies, the Nintendo 64, wouldn't be ready to launch until 1996, which was already given their competitors free reign to grow. Not only that, but the president of Nintendo specifically, Hiroshi Yamauchi, wanted Mario, Legend of Zelda and other popular titles Nintendo was known for to debut exclusively on the 64 when it released. Meaning the longer they waited to release the console, the longer their most important and worked on games at the time would also be delayed. So in a last ditch effort to steal away some marketing thunder from the PlayStation's release, the Nintendo execs decided to release the Virtual Boy early and unfinished. The technology behind the Virtual Virtual Boy was truly capable of early 3D and it could have been done with the technology at the time. Had Yokoi been given more time to develop the console, implement a stronger processing chip after finding out it would no longer be as portable as he thought it would be, and been given permission to launch the system with premier titles that sell consoles, like a new Mario game or just anything at this point, but instead it launched with titles like Galactic Pinball and Red Alarm. And even the more Nintendo IP focused games that the company is known for were pretty underwhelming, with the console later getting Mario's Tennis and Mario Clash. Like what the hell even is Mario Clash, I've genuinely never heard of that before in my life. With these much needed changes to the console itself and good launch titles, the failure of the Virtual Boy could have been a much different story. The console would be quickly discontinued in the same year of its release in Japan and would only last an extra 8 months or so in North America. The sales for the Virtual Boy were so bad that to this day it's the only console they don't disclose the sale numbers of on their official website. But in 1996, Nintendo reached out to Famitsu, which is one of Japan's longest running and most popular video game magazine publications, and told them the total sales for the console, which was 770,000 units worldwide. Now that may not sound so bad at first, but keep in mind everything Nintendo was putting out before and after it was selling tens of millions of units in comparison, and it didn't help that Nintendo thought that the Virtual Boy would eventually be a household name, with millions of projected sales at a minimum. Yokoi shouldered a majority of the blame for the Virtual Boy's failure, and as an apology to the company, he developed the Game Boy Pocket, which was a lighter and smaller version of the Game Boy, and was honestly a pretty impressive piece of tech for the time, that improved the original Game Boy in a lot of ways, with it having reduced sprite blurring and requiring half the batteries. Yokoi left Nintendo shortly after that on August 15th, 1996, after over 31 years 
of working with the company and opened up his own product development company called Kotto Laboratory and started by being the lead developer of Bandai's handheld, the Wonder Swan. But unfortunately, Yokoi's lifelong ambition of designing products independently from Nintendo was short-lived. On October 4th, 1997, Yokoi was riding in a car driven by his friend on the expressway until it rear-ended a truck. Yokoi leapt out of the car to check if the other driver was hurt and to see the damage afflicted to both vehicles and that's when he was tragically struck twice by passing motorists and was left critically injured. Just two hours later, Yokoi was pronounced dead at just 56 years old. In 2003, Gunpei Yokoi was recognised with a Lifetime Achievement Award of the International Game Developers Association, and also an art gallery in Japan created an exhibit dedicated to him in 2010 titled The Man Who Was Called the God of Games, which featured all his key contributions to Nintendo. Gunpei Yokoi is just one of many people that helped make Nintendo the gaming conglomerate that it is today, but I wanted to talk about him specifically just because of how interesting and far-reaching his talent and ideas were. He truly paved the way for not just Nintendo's widely successful successful handhelds or some of their long-running game franchises, but for the entire gaming industry in many ways too. And to help convey how ahead of the curve he was, let me just tell you his own philosophy from as far back as the early 70s. The Nintendo way of adapting technology is not to look for the state of the art, but to utilise mature technology that can be mass-produced cheaply. Yokoi called this philosophy lateral thinking with withered technology, which essentially means finding new and interesting ways to use mature or cheap cheap technology that is well understood, or as he would describe it, withered. And this is a philosophy that Nintendo clearly still uses and profits from to this day. Nintendo may not have the most revolutionary hardware and technology compared to the competition, but the way they use that technology has always made them a unique company with some interesting consoles, games and ideas. And without this one man using that mindset to create some of the most creative devices for the company, and making it a staple of what Nintendo thrive on to this day, the company could have ended up a whole lot different. 